so for tonight, I'm going to be trying to demonstrate some of the steps that I use in order to make a pen like this. It's a steampunk armor plate. And I'm going to go ahead and admit that I am absolutely no expert in this. I'm simply a novice. Uh, I first, I saw some, uh, saw some pins, saw some pin blanks on the internet and um, wanted to see what I could do to make my own. And I stumbled across this article from the International Association of Pen Turners, may, uh, produced by Dennis Peabody. And in here, he goes into step-by-step step as far as how to make one of these blanks. You start out with HVAC aluminum tape. Uh, pretty much everybody has this around their shop for one reason or another. Um, another option is, I got this for Amazon. It's similar, except it's copper tape. Um, I think this is marketed toward people trying to get keep slugs out of their potted plants outside, which, from what I understand, it works. I take a piece of, it's the backing off a label sheet. I don't know exactly what you call it, but it's slick. Nothing is stick to it. And I put one layer of tape down. I take another layer, roughly the same size. Peel the backing off as best as I can. It's called silicone coated release liner. Silicone coated release. Is, is that what this is called? Yeah, my company used to make it back in the 90s. Okay, well, they didn't make it for people that chew their fingernails like I do. No, they, when they were good, they were next to garbage. <laughs> and I take three layers and I put it on this backing because I will have some spillover as you can see right here and I didn't want it to stick. Um, I think these are called brayers. Uh, found this one at Hobby Lobby in the ink department, which I believe they use for some sort of ink blotting. And just roll it out flat. And I take scissors and trim up the edges. Basically just trying to get rid of that um, if you're more careful with the overlay, you have less trimming to do. So we'll just stop with that. Cut off that end. Cut off that end. And then I get into cutting just random strips. Now I won't go into all this just to save some time. I won't cut the whole thing. But essentially, that's what you're doing. You're just cutting random strips and again well there's some overlay on that one so i'll cut that off and leave it and then cut these into random shapes as well now when i said that i was not an expert at this believe me i'm not uh, there are some guys out there that do this that bring this to the next level uh, and it's truly an art form uh, just a few that I'd like to mention is um, Andrew Amtower. Andrew Amtower, he brings, he, he these are literally art. Um, Mick Lawrence, he's out of Australia. He makes the steampunk blanks that are out of this world. Um, Brent Smith does some where this portion is steampunk. This portion is dyed stabilized burl um, called a hybrid blank and they are absolutely stunning. I believe David Troutman has done 
has done a turning on those at one point in time. A uh, couple other guys, John David Jones and Chris, uh, I'm sorry, Chad Schimmel at Turner's Warehouse. So essentially, you get a bunch of those little things right there, call them aluminum confetti, and I've cut up a few in advance just to go over. Um, tubes. Every pin kit, or most pin kits nowadays, comes with tubes. Of course, you can buy them extra. Um, I know Turner's Warehouse sells um, pin tubes by themselves, and I think a pack of 25 Sierras is like $6. It's next to nothing. That way you can go ahead and prepare your pin blanks before you actually get your pin kit. Now, I like the Sierras um, for a couple different reasons. One is that there are so many different pin kits out there that use a Sierra tube. The one in particular tonight that I'm talking about is the Monarch Grande. Um, the Monarch Grande is a lot bigger, thicker than say this Aries. And the Aries comes from Taylor's Murfield. It's, it's one of their kits. It's a lot thicker and there's a reason that you need the thick. Uh, it's also thicker than say your Elegant Monarch. Try to hold them side by side where you can see them. What I've got out here for comparison, these are, this is a Monarch bushing, I'm sorry, a Sierra bushing. What I have here is a bushing for the Monarch Grande, which is, I'm gonna try to show you, is a little bit bigger. Hey, you can see that, okay. A um, little bit bigger. Which, in, which means that you're going to get a lot of more meat between the top or outside of the tube and to where the bushings stop. Um, one thing I wanted to point out in this particular blank that I've turned for the Monarch Grande and what I've done is I've turned this one and sanded it to 400. So this is the pin that I'm gonna be polishing. This is the blank that I'll be polishing up later. But it's been turned to the Monarch Grande. If I put the Monarch or the regular Sierra bushings on, you can see the difference. And sometimes that difference is needed and I'm hoping I can show this to you because where, okay, it's kind of hard to see. If you look for it, you can see the outside. If I can get my, there we go. You see that little bit of reflection right there at the blank. What that is, is the outermost portion of the aluminum tape. So if you try to put this blank on a regular Sierra, you're gonna be eating into the aluminum tape before you get to your bushings, and then the blank is ruined. So if you have a lot of material between the tube and the outside portion of your blank, um, say for watch parts or such like this, you're gonna need a thicker kit like the Monarch Grande, uh, Sierra Vista. I think the Wall Street 3 is a little bit thicker. Um, but they just have just more meat between the tube and the outside of the pen. So this is the pen, or this is the blank that we'll be polishing up a little bit later. So we have a Sierra tube hundreds of these little things. And when you have a roll of aluminum tape such as this, you could literally make thousands and thousands of steampunk blanks because, well, 
I don't remember when I bought this roll. I've had it for so long. And as you can see, I've got miles left on it. So what I do is I take an ice pick or an awl or something, something of that fashion. And I have a piece of rigid rubber. And let me see if I can zoom in here. And poke holes in it. And then take some of this, what do they call it, Dave? Silicone backing or something? Release liner. And put that on the tube. Now, you keep going around, keep going around the base of the tube or one end of the tube. And what I like to do is I like to do the ends of the tube first because the ends of the tube are, of course, the most critical um, when you're turning a pin because this is where huh, the resin meets the road, so to speak, when it comes into the uh, pin components. Um, toward the middle of the pin, you can get a little bit thicker, uh, but toward the ends of the pin, of course, you need to stay as thin as possible. Uh, we're already dealing with it may not sound a lot, but we're already dealing with three layers of aluminum tape that they're at the end of it. Um, and basically do both, both, both ends, then go towards the middle, and you are left with something like this. And let me see. Left with something like Uh, focus, focus, focus. There we go. All right. Then what I need to do is I need to take an X-Acto knife and trim these edges up. And what you need to do is instead of sawing back and forth, push towards the middle. Always push towards the middle because if you start pulling back, what will happen is it's possible to get some of that aluminum tape to peel off where you don't want it. And of course, be careful not to slice it into your thumb or finger. John, did you overlap those bits of tape a little bit? Yes, and I'll show that to you again. I'll show that to you here in just a second. So what I'm going to try to try to get you is a a clearer shot. It's awful hard to do with the reflection, but yes, you overlap uh, some of the places. I might have butted it up very tightly against the next piece, but more often than not, yes, you overlap to cover up the com uh, to cover up the brass tube completely. And you overlapped end to end as well as top to bottom. End to end, you meaning going this going in this direction? Yes. 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 In fact, uh, I'll even bring this piece back out. Yeah, you basically, you overlap from here. You can go off the end of the tube because you're gonna be trim trimming that up eventually anyway. But yeah, you overlap from here, overlap from this side, overlap from this side, basically to cover up the entire brass tube or no brass at all is showing, which is what I hopefully did in this 
piece right here. Um, what I like to do at this point is kind of just roll the ends with my fingers to make sure that they are flush as flush as can be. For the next step, rubber gloves are a necessity. Well, they're not a necessity, but you will be spending a lot of time cleaning this gunk off your fingers if you don't use rubber gloves. To get the steampunk or aged effect onto these blanks, I use a product called Ebony Rub and Buff. It's a wax metallic finish. You can get this, um, I got this at Hobby Lobby. I think a tube of this is nine or $10, but with the 40% coupon, you know, you're paying around six for it. And one tube will, will last quite a long time. I'm gonna put a paper towel out so I won't get it all over everything. Now I've tried putting this on with a paintbrush. I've tried putting it on with, uh, you know, Q-tips, different ways to um, try to keep it off my hands as much as possible. But the best way to do it is just to get down and dirty, put on some rubber gloves and rub it in. And what you're trying to do is you're trying to take this wax metallic finish, this rub and buff, and get it into every crook and crevice and cranny that is in this blank. And as you can see, it makes an absolute mess. But the longer you rub it, it starts to dry and you can keep rubbing it. I mean, you could actually stop right here and have well, a dark or almost black steampunk blank. Or just get a paper towel and kind of lightly rub it. And the more you rub it, the more the aluminum from the aluminum tape is going to show up and it's starting to dry. I can, I can, I can feel it getting tacky. I hope everybody can see that. Okay. But it's starting to get that aged look. And as soon as I get, uh, as soon as I get this to where I'd like it to be, I'll get it toward the camera and show you. But what has happened is by rubbing that uh, rub and buff into the aluminum or into the uh, little holes that were poked into the blank. I want to focus. You can see that the little holes that you poked in the blank have turned into what looks like rivets that are aged. That's all it takes to get something like this accomplished. Other than, let me get those cameras right. Other than, of course, putting it in resin. So that's the effect that you would get just by doing the armor plates. Um, when I announced, or when I said that I was gonna be doing the steampunk armor plate, it was suggested that I also show um, some watch parts. So I will try to put a couple watch parts onto that blank. But what I wanted to do first, um, I've been using Alumalite Clear. Uh, there's a seven minute working time on it, 
these are the mold. This is the mold that I use. You can do four, I can do four of these at a time. Um, and essentially you just put that blank in there, put the little rubber stopper in one side. Okay, put the little rubber stopper in the other side, mash them together and at the same time, pull that top edge out. And what that does is it creates a little buffer on either side for the resin to go into instead of the resin running into this uh, blue silicone. And just use your normal resin casting procedures, pressure pot. I'm not gonna get into resin casting. There's plenty of videos out there on YouTube about that. Um, <clears throat> if you'd like to know more about resin casting, I would suggest uh, Zach Higgins at NV Woodworks. Uh, he has an excellent YouTube channel out there and goes into all different uh, different variations of casting. He's If you have a question about casting, he has the answer. So we will take the blank that was just created, Steampunk blank, <clears throat> and I'm going to put it on my watch part stand. This is something that I made myself. It is just a piece of extruded aluminum, piece of all thread. Um, I epoxied some nuts into some little handles that I turned. Also turned the, um, I guess, CA bushings for lack of a better term, but these are HDPE. Turned those on the lathe. And I put those on there just to give it a little bit of something to rest on. Screw that in. And now I have a, an excellent platform and I'm going to zoom you into it. An excellent platform to be able to put my watch parts on. Um, I get my watch parts, get back out. I get my watch parts from um, eBay. You can get literally a ton of these for like 10 or $12. Um, I wouldn't, on a blank such as this, I wouldn't recommend, I mean, you could if you wanted to, especially into middle, is to put uh, some sort of watch face. Again, I get these watch faces. Uh, I got these from eBay and I got these off of Etsy. Uh, the ones I got off of Etsy have more of an antique look to them. So I think the, 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 the person that I bought these off of Etsy, uh, these were pretty much hand-picked or hand-selected to have more of a steampunk antique look as opposed to the ones I get <clears throat> from China through eBay that are a just a smorgasbord of everything. Colorful, non-colorful, something that big I'll probably, I'll probably never use because, well, not many pin blanks can take a, pin, uh, a watch face that size. You make a bottle stopper, exactly. Um, so what I've done, another piece of uh, equipment that I recommend if you're going to be doing watch parts is something called a jeweler's anvil. Um, basically, it's just a piece of metal with lots of little holes in it. And I have cre I've made a little tray for it, per se, that fits in here. Um, as you can see down there in the bottom, I have a bunch of gears. And I'll show you where those come from in just a second. Uh, there's a little tray around the middle of it, around the edge. That way, if I'm rooting through here, and I see a piece that I might want to use later, I go ahead and pull it out instead of trying to find it again in here because it would be virtually impossible. But I'll put in an old tray to use a little bit later. <clears throat> um, to take my tweezers, put that in here, drop the 
the axle into one of those holes. Use the back end of my tweezers and pop the axle out. And now I'm left with just the gear itself. And if I wanted to, at some point in time, I'll go in here, take one of those axles out and use that onto a pin as well. So that way they're not going all over the floor, all over the shop, making a huge mess. Again, take the axle, put it over one of those holes, use the back edge of the tweezers and pop it out. And now you're left with just the gear itself, which is what we want. The way I bend the watch parts, wrong way, is with a jeweler's dapping block. Um, I think this came from eBay. I'm not exactly sure. I can't remember. I've had it for quite a while. Uh, but I just put that in one of the channels, take like a I, I, this was, a, I think, a cold chisel or a cold punch, and just mash it down. For the heavier ones, for the ones that don't like to bend, you can get one of these hammers from Harbor Freight for like $3 and tap it in. So back to this, what I use to glue it down, glue the watch parts down, is... LA Colors Rapid Dry Nail Polish. Um, nail polish doesn't have, doesn't react to alumilite like CA glue would. CA glue and alumilite don't like each other. Um, CA glue is more expensive than this. I got this at uh, the Dollar Tree for, you guessed it, a dollar. And just tap it right in there. I did get some special tweezers, as you can see. These are um, have ceramic tips or porcelain tips. I don't know exactly how they work because I've never been into one of the vaping stores, but apparently these are used in the vaping industry for one reason or another. If anybody knows anything about vaping, you may know more about these tweezers but the glue doesn't stick to these like a normal pair of uh, tweezers. And you can take uh, the back edge of your X-Acto knife or the back edge of some scissors and just kind of scrape off any glue that builds up or any nail polish that, glue, that glues up. Can you hear me? Yes. Uh, another thing you can use instead of the nail polish is UV, um, uh, what is it, UV rosin. Um, works works really well too, and it does not interact with alumilite either. You just need to have a little uh, light source to cure the rosin. You can actually get a piece, you can actually get a, a kit on um, Amazon for about uh, nine or ten dollars that has the light source built into it. So. Okay. So I won't go into a lot of, uh, go into putting a lot of parts onto this blank, but just to give you an idea, and let me see if I can block out that light a little. Still not focusing. I had a quick question, John. Do yeah. you know what typically the break even is? Like how many watch type pens do you have to do before the equipment pays for itself versus buying the blanks? You know what I mean? It, from what I understand, 
your first pen cost you about $10,000 to make. So if you make two pens, you're $5,000 a pen. So the more that you make, the less each one is going to cost you. Is that about right? Um, I, I don't know. I was <laughs> if I only wanted to make two, I'm assuming I would just buy blanks. But at some oh. point, I imagine there ought to be a way for um, the investment to start to really triumph over buying blanks. Oh, I, I completely agree with you. If you just wanted one or two watch part blanks, then by all means, there are plenty of manufacturers out there that uh, make watch part blanks that are, well, that can outshine anything that I can do or any, probably any of us can do. It's, uh, so yes, to answer your question, spending say $50 on a watch part blank would be a lot cheaper in the long run if you only wanted one or two than to acquire some of this equipment. Of course, on the grand scheme of things, I don't know exactly how much I've got tied up into this. I'd probably say a couple hundred dollars maybe with everything. Um, but there again, it's something that keeps me off the streets at night. I get out in my shop, turn on the music, and just sit here and make watch parts, make watch part blanks. Um, so let me see if I can try to get this focus back in. That's a little better. And like I said, I've all, I only put two watch parts on here. And if I were doing, say, aluminum, I would only go with uh, gold or brass colored watch parts. Uh, if I were doing something like this blank that I've made out of copper tape, I would go something with the contrasting and only use the silver or chrome watch part blanks. Um, does anybody have any questions about this process here? One thing I meant to add, yes, it does take some time to go and poke holes into every little square and rectangle. <clears throat> such as that. But, and I have tried this and I didn't like it. In the sewing department at Walmart, Hobby Lobby, this, that, and the other, you can find something called a tracing wheel. Um, I don't know how they're used in sewing. I don't do much sewing at all. But I thought that that would be a neat way and a quick and easy way to put the holes in the aluminum tape, which it does. However, I didn't like it because they're too uniform. They're all in a straight line. They're all equally spaced. And when you're making a blank such as this with random shapes in a random pattern. It just didn't look good to me to have uniformity in the, I guess you call them rivets. Um, so if nobody has any questions about that, we will get on with the polishing of this blank where I'm gonna show you how I finish uh, an acrylic blank. But so I've, I've turned this uh, turned this down to save some time. Um, sanded it to 400 with Abernet. And I'm going to start the polishing by using the micro mesh um, sanding pads, not sanding pads, the sanding strips. They're not the, uh, these are to be used. Can you use these wet? Uh, 
Uh, you can. Okay. But I use them dry. Yeah. I use my micro mesh pads wet. I use these dry. Um, I just got these not too long ago. I really like them. Um, the 1500 is the one that we're going to be starting out. It has the equivalent of 400 grit. Um, like I said, I've already sanded to 400, so we're going to be doing another 400. And for the first three grits, I sand this way. And I know that that's going to wash out. Yeah, that washes it out. But I want to make sure all the lateral scratches are gone. This is 1800. We'll move on to 2400. All right. And for the next six grits, we're just going to go wide open. Now I've got the lathe spinning at about 2600 RPM. kind of buffing off any or rubbing off any of the residue that may be on the blank between the grips. And finishing up with the 12,000. Now, in the past, I would have probably stopped with that because before I went to this next method I'm going to show you, this is where I would have stopped at and went on to a buffing wheel. I don't use the buffing wheel as much anymore once I found out about <clears throat> Stadium Pin Blanks Magic Juice. Um, of course, it comes from Stadium Pin Blanks, a gentleman by the name of um, Robert Harden. Mike. Mike. Is it Mike Harden? Mike Harden. Put it together. <clears throat> it is six different models, starting with 35, going to 15. 10, 8, 5, and 3. Um, unlike sandpaper where we go to a higher number, this one goes to a lower number uh, the finer you get. And applying this magic juice couldn't be more simpler. What I do is I take a paper towel and I get the select size rolls from I think Costco. Fold it in half fold it in half again, fold it in half again, where I'm left with about an inch and a quarter strip of paper towel. Again, I'm on about 20, what did I say, 2,600 RPM? Yeah, 2,600 RPM. And I want to put just a pea-sized dollop on it. That's all you need. Again, I'm starting with the 35. And what I want to try to do is I want to feed it into the bottom of the blank as I'm going, just to kind of coat it all, get it in there, rub it in there real good. And for the first, for this 35, you can pretty much tell 
when you, it has a gritty feel to it. And you can tell after a few seconds, it's gone. And that's what's left on your paper towel. What I do from that point is turn the paper towel around and I'm gonna use this edge with the 15. Again, just a piece size dollop. Feed it into the bottom of the lathe so it won't splatter everywhere and rub it in. I can feel that the grit has gone away. And that's what I'm left with after that. Let me put some lids on some stuff over here so I don't knock it over. And here we go to the tin. Using the back side of the paper towel, a little dollop. Rub that in real good. I turn the paper towel around again to use the other side of the clean edge with the number eight. Rub that in. There are two left, so what we will do is we will use the middle portion of the paper towel. We'll dollop in there on the number five. Kind of feed it in slowly and rub it in. And of course, last but not least, is number three, where we will use the other side of the paper towel. Whoop, came out a little bit more than I thought. This is, of course, is the last step. And the last part of the polishing process. And I hope you probably can't see that very well on this camera, but it has created an amazing looking finish. All right, so the only thing that you need to do to clean up is take a little bit of paper towel and rub it into each end of the blank because some of that uh, magic juice is bound to get in there. So what we'll do now is we'll assemble the pen. So what I have done is I've used one of those pin presses that we've all had, we've all used and all hated. Um, John Walsh got a hold of some scrap HTPE a while back. And I got just a, a piece of, again, this is just a scrap piece of HTPE that you could, I think was used to make molds. And I got a piece of HTPE rod that I got from Amazon and basically just turned a plug of HDPE that was fit in my drill press and would be the, I'd make this my pin assembly station as well. One thing I like to do, one thing I like to point out is in the deli 
section of Harris Teeter and Walmart, you can get the deli meat that comes in these little trays. I have found that these little trays are great for holding all of the blanks, parts, and pieces needed to make individual pins. So whenever I have a kit matched up with a particular blank that I want to make, I'll put it all in one of these little plastic bins, and that way it's all there. And I know Joe is thinking, my God, he's organized. Isn't that right, Joe? I know you can hear you me. Got, you, got, you got that right, buddy. <laughs> <laughs> so another little tip that I'd like to share is that we've all made our pins and just mashed the kit into the blank itself. The problem is, is that if you're mashing into the end of this blank, you might have a tendency to break the blank or, or mess it up. Bob Blanford over at RGB Woodturner on YouTube, he came up with a neat little suggestion. And when I saw it, I thought, why didn't I think of that? What he suggests doing is taking the bushing from your pen, inserting that into the blank, and that way, when you're compressing, you're not compressing everything into the end of the blank. Everything is being compressed into the bushing that the pin was made from, and it's less likely to crack. So I'm gonna try to get my hands out of the way once I get this lined up. John, if you drill a variety of holes in that bottom plate to fit the different size bushings, uh, it really makes it and then it would just drop down into that a little ways and it really holds it in place. That's what I've done. Follow me? That's an excellent suggestion. So I'm gonna try to get this started by hand. I'll be out here drilling holes in this plate tomorrow, Joe. There we go. I think you'll find if you drive probably four or five different size holes and match your bushings, that'll probably do most of your pens. I think you're right. That's, that's because I mean, typically, I mean, most of us pen turners, we find, you know, a dozen or so pen kits that we're comfortable with that we like to make on a regular basis. So yeah, putting a dozen holes into this ain't gonna matter a whole lot. Or not, not holes, but indentations. But yes, I will, I will definitely be out here drilling holes in this thing tomorrow. Actually, you only need to drill two holes, or one, one hole if you get the TVC adapters. It'll fit every bushing you've got. <laughs> <laughs> True. <laughs> So that's all there is to making this pen. Let me get over here to this camera. That's a beautiful pen, John. And that's beautiful. just, thank you, thank you. And that's just, uh, you know, using the MicroMesh pads, polishing pads, and the uh, Magic Juice. I'll put up some, uh, I'll put up some pictures of this pen on our Facebook group. And at the end of this video, uh, once it's uploaded to YouTube, uh, but yeah, you can, uh, it, it, they're, they're very simple to make. I mean, they are time consuming and tedious sometimes, but over, overall, they're fun to make. 